We've been in this epistle now for the last four months. It's only three chapters long, but we've been in it for four months, going chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And Paul is bringing this letter, this epistle to a close. And what I want to do is just give a little bit of review because we have not been in this book for the last few weeks. And so some of us might have forgotten the things that we've covered and looked at. And so I want to give a little bit of a review before we dive into our text. We only covered one verse the last time we were together, and that was verse 6. Now there's two things that we see Paul addressing as he closes this epistle out. And those two things are found in accountability and responsibility. He's having the church in Thessalonica keep other members in their church accountable to the way they were living, the things that we're doing, and that they bear a responsibility. And so those two ideas and thoughts is what I believe Paul is really communicating to the church in Thessalonica. Guys, there is accountability in your walk, and there is responsibility we have as a church. And as Paul brings these two things to light, he does so with very strong exhortation. He does so with very strong warning, strong commands, strong exhortation. And you remember what exhortation is. It's a strong worded encouragement. It's instruction to that we ought to be doing and living out in our church. And so Paul does this because he's dealing with an issue with the church. There's a problem in Thessalonica. There are some issues with the believers not obeying the word of God. And remember, as we talk about problems, they're going to be in every church. There is no perfect church. The church is made up of broken believers, saved believers by the, by the grace of God, the mercy of God, because of the blood of Christ. But nevertheless, there can be problems that arise. And when problems happen in the church, they need to be addressed. If they're not addressed, if they're not solved, they grow and they become worse. And remember the illustration I gave a few weeks back. You know, if you ever step on a rusty nail, listen, you don't just sit back and think it's all good. No, you go to the doctor, you get that tetanus shot, right? If you don't, man, weird things can happen in your body. I saw pictures online of people with tetanus, and they're like all bent around. It's weird, man, that can mess you up. But you go to the doctor, why? To prevent it from spreading, from preventing it from getting worse. You see, church problems are like physical problems. If left unresolved, they grow become worse, and they have the ability to affect other believers in the church. There's a great pastor by the name of of Warren Worsby, and I love his commentaries, and he says this over this passage. He says, the local church is a body, and what germs are to the physical body, sin is to the spiritual body. So as Paul is dealing with this problem, he brings our attention to a number of things happening. In these passages, he talks about an unruly Christian. An unruly Christian are those Christians that are kind of living a defiant Christian life. They're doing their own thing, caring about their own issues, not really thinking of the greater body of Christ. And as a result of that, he's dealing with other Christians that are taking advantage of other Christians. They're not working. They're going around asking for you a few bucks from everybody in the church, and it's ongoing, and and it never ends. They never uh, uh, go back and pay back those believers. And as a result of that, some of them are becoming, well, Paul describes them as busy bodies. And lastly, Paul addresses laziness. Now, again, how do we know these are the topics? Because we read that in the text that we just read a moment ago. And so he brings up these two areas these two important topics of accountability and responsibility. And again, we see this throughout not only 1 Thessalonians, but also 2 Thessalonians, because he gives the foundation of this. In fact, look back at verse 4 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Paul says in verse 4, And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. See, Paul was giving instruction to the church, but he was also giving commands, things that they had to do. These commands were to be obeyed, to be followed. In fact, those two terms, command and obeyed, is used a number of times in this closing chapter. He uses it in verse 4, in verse 6, in verse 10, verse 12, verse 14. And the point is simply this, is that what Paul is instructing the church in Thessalonica that these are not mere suggestions. 
These aren't just good ideas to grow your church or, or to have a, you know, a, th- a thriving church. These are commands that they had to follow. Commands that Paul says are brought in the name of the Lord. Now, the one verse we looked at was verse six. So let's read that really quick to, to kind of look at it for a moment. And then we'll continue on in the chapter. But Paul says in verse six, we command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. Paul gives these instructions in the name of the Lord. And what Paul is doing is he is exercising his apostolic authority. He is, he is the establishing pastor. And as an establishing pastor, as the apostle, he's saying, guys, you need to he- heed the words I'm giving you. You need to follow them. You need to obey them. These are instructions. And the problem is so serious that Paul has to bring this up a number of times. And what's Paul commanding them to do? Well, he's commanding them in that church to withdraw from other Christians in that church, to withdraw from brothers and sisters that are walking disorderly, that are not following the words that he gave to them. When it says tradition, it is the oral commands, oral aspect of God's word that he gave to them and that they were to withdraw from them. In other words, again, those Christians aren't heeding God's word and they know it. We're to remove the social aspect of our relationship with them in that church. They were to disfellowship from them. And that's a pretty serious charge. That's a pretty serious thing to do, to disfellowship with them. And again, some might read Paul's word and take offense. Some might read Paul's instruction and think, man, who is Paul to tell me to tell our church what to do? I'm a grown man. I can do whatever I want. And one of the things we already talked about a couple of weeks ago is that where there is biblical and godly leadership, it should be matched with biblical and godly submission. If the leadership of a church is walking in in, in disobedience and sin and arrogance and pride, it does not require its congregants to, to yield to that. But Paul was a man of godliness. He was walking according to the word, which we'll read and look at in just a moment. And so Paul commanded them that they were to deal with this. In the church, there's accountability. There is responsibility in the church, accountability in the church. And there are also at times in which church discipline is done. And we talked about this again a few weeks ago, but to recap, there's two aspects of how church discipline can be done in the church. One is preventative, and second is corrective. The preventative happens when the word of God is taught. When God words, God's word provides clarity and direction, understanding, it's there that you are given command to follow, obedience, the structure in which God wants us to live in the church and outside the church. And when, the, God's, word, when God's word is rightly divided, presented accurately, the Holy Spirit will use that in your life and in my life to bring about a response, a response to act, to follow, to obey. The second is corrective. This is when correction is needed. It needs to be done with love and care and sincerity. And this happens a number of different ways. We talked about Matthew 18, how if a brother sins against us, we go to them in private, just us and them. And we seek to to mend that area of sin and disobedience. If they don't listen to us, we bring another person to witness this, to also bring encouragement in the problem of sin and, and the area of offense. If they won't listen to them, we bring it before the leaders in the same way, there's these levels of correction. But we also have a responsibility. You have a responsibility as we do this with love and grace and patience. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 6.1. We'll put it up on the screen if we can. Paul talking to a different church, to different churches. He says, Brother, brethren, if a man is overtaken in a trespass, you who are spiritual should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be be tempted. Again, we have a responsibility. If we have one of our brothers or sisters, you know, not seeking the Lord, walking in disobedience, if we see that, we recognize that, we go to them because we love them. He says, what are you doing? Why are you making these decisions? That's not the, you know that's not what God wants. This is what the Bible says. And we seek to restore them 
back into fellowship with the Lord and with the church. Now, Paul has been addressing these issues. This epistle was not the first time Paul addresses this. He addresses a number of these things in his first epistle. Now, remember how things played out. God miraculously spoke to Paul. He was trying to go to Asia and and to take the gospel there. The, The Holy Spirit forbid him back in Acts chapter 16. It was through that process that God gave him this vision of this man from Macedonia who said, hey, come, come this way. And that is where Paul sails across with Silas and Timothy across the Aegean Sea. And for the very first time, the gospel is brought to Europe. He lands in that area of Philippi. And in Philippi, a church is birthed. And then he travels down to Berea and then down to Thessalonica. And Paul only spent a few weeks in Thessalonica. And he was, he was kind of out, he was ran out of town by the, the people who hated the gospel. And so he leaves that and he leaves Timothy and Silas there. He ends up going down to Athens and then down to Corinth. And he spends about a year in Corinth. About a year later, he gets a report of what's happening in Thessalonica and he writes 1 Thessalonians. He sends it back with a messenger. It gets sent to the church. And only three or four months later, he gets a new report of how the church is doing. And that is where we get 2 Thessalonians. Now, this is why when Paul closes his letter, he's being so much more firm and strong-worded, saying, guys, listen, you need to listen to what I'm saying. You're walking in disobedience. You need to heed what I'm saying and follow this instruction. The problem, some of those in Thessalonica were still not receptive or obedient to God's word. And so what does Paul say? Guys, if you do that, if you don't listen to my word, you need to, in that church, disfellowship from them. Create space from them. And I hope this paints a better picture. Now, let me give a little bit more background on what what was causing this. Remember that there's a lot of eschatology in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. You know, Paul deals with the resurrection, Paul deals with the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And, and we spent a month in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talking about the Antichrist. And we spent, I mean, that was a really cool chapter. So there's a lot of eschatology about future things, about Jesus coming back. And so one of the issues that was happening in the church of Thessalonica had to do with the rapture and had to do with the second coming of Christ. And when they heard about Christ coming back, sadly, some of those Christians began to live irresponsibly. But how? How can a Christian live irresponsibly? They stopped working. They quit their jobs. They abandoned their farms. They stopped tithing. They stopped supporting other believers. Again, in their mind, it's like, hey, Jesus is coming back, so hey, let's let's charge our credit cards to the max. And other Christians were like, amen, amen. I'm going to get the things I want. In fact, what we're going to do is we're going to charge our credit cards and we're going to stick the bill to the Antichrist. Yeah, let's do that. That's kind of what they were thinking. Now, they didn't have credit cards back then, but the principle was the same thing. They kind of abandoned their jobs. Jesus is coming back, man. Why do we have to work? Why? I, I don't need to work. And so after time, guess what happened? Bills started coming. I began to, uh, you know, the credit card bills started coming up. The, the, the month, the rent began coming up and they began to go around and take advantage of people in the church. Hey man, can you have a couple bucks to spare? I need some gas. Okay, sure. They gave a couple, hey, do you mind? Do you have like five bucks? I need some lunch, man, I'm hungry. Sure, here you go. And they began, and over time, it became, became this issue in the church where these Christians were taking advantage of the generosity and love of the other believers. You know, when I was, when I was reading this and thinking about this, I couldn't help but think of Popeye. Anybody guys remember pop cartoon Popeye? You guys remember Wimpy in Popeye? Wimpy was the guy who always ate hamburgers, right? And he would say, he would have this line in the cartoon, hey, I gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today, right? And that's, Wimpy always did that. He went around, I was like, hey man, do you mind buying me a burger? And I'll pay you back, you know, time. But here's the problem. They, it wasn't reciprocated. They weren't paying their debt back. They weren't doing what they were supposed to do. In fact, what those Christians were doing was going directly against the words of Jesus. I don't know if you remember the parable of the minas. 
But there Jesus makes a very important aspect of this, of looking forward in the future and between now and his coming, now and his kingdom, how we're supposed to live. Let me read this to you, Luke 19, 12 through 13. Jesus said, a certain noble, nobleman went into a far country uh, to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And so he called 10 of his servants and delivered to them 10 minas. And he said to them, do business till I come or occupy until I come. And this parable all had to do with Jesus coming back. I'm gonna give you these resources, these talents. And between the time that I give them to you and the time I come back, you need to invest. You need to occupy. You need to be busy about the Lord's work. That's the point. You see, what Paul had to correct was their theology and their thinking. It's this idea that the return of Christ was not to motivate us to laziness, but to action and motion and purpose. You know, maybe that's the way you're thinking. You know what? Jesus is coming back, and I'll get right with God right before he gets back. Or Jesus is coming back, and I don't need to worry about my finances. I can just charge things. I can, you know, I can file for bankruptcy. I can not pay my debtors, you know, it goes directly against what Jesus is saying. We need to be found faithful when he comes back. And these believers in Thessalonica, they were not being faithful. So what does Paul say? Well, let's pick up where we left off, verse seven. Seven all the way to nine. He says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but we worked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. Not because we don't have authority, but because we make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Paul believed in the imminent return of Christ. He lived with this this doctrine of imminence. He believed Jesus was gonna come back any time. But that didn't prevent Paul from staying busy for the Lord. It didn't stop Paul from working to make a living. It didn't stop Paul from reaching people for the name of Christ. And what Paul does here, he gives them an argument, a moral authoritative argument that his life was matching God's word. That his life was matching his own words. That what he told them to do, he wasn't playing the hypocrite. That they were to follow his example and be obedient to the Lord. Now, this isn't the first time Paul does this. He did this in many epistles when it came to this aspect of correction or encouragement. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, Paul tells them, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. You see, Paul knew the importance that his faith and his words, that his life matched both that his actions matched the things he said, and that his life matched God's word. And so he tells the church, hey, follow me as I follow the Lord. Well, that's what he's doing now to them, saying, guys, I told you how to live. Why aren't you doing it? I told you how to live. Now follow my example. And what was Paul's example? Well, look what he says in verse seven. For we were not disorderly among you. Now remember, we talked about these words um, weeks ago, and this idea of disorderly is a kind of military term of walking in step, walking in line, walking in cadence, and how important that is. In other words, we as members of the church are not allowed to live our lives however we choose. We live our lives according to the word of God, according to his commands and instructions. And yet some of those in Thessalonica, they were doing whatever they wanted. And Paul says, no, even I didn't do that. I'm not doing whatever I want. I'm walking in line and in step to God's word and obedience to him, and so should you. We're doing the right thing, Paul says. We're working, we're serving, we're not becoming lazy. Look what else he says in verse eight. He says, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge. In other words, he didn't go around knocking on on other believers' doors. Hey man, what are you guys having for dinner? Stove tough, I'm coming over, right? It wasn't like that. Paul wasn't going around taking advantage of the believers. But what did he do? He says, we worked with labor and toil night and day. Did you guys know that as much as possible, 
Paul lived a bivocational life. Do you know what that means? Bivocational means that he received tithe and offerings from the church at times, and on other times he worked a regular job. No, do you guys know what Paul's job was, what he did? For, he was a tent maker. You know, most likely his parents were a tent ma- maker, and that's what he learned to do as a young Jew growing up, you know? And so that's what he did. He would go to these cities. He'd find a local tape maker and say, hey, I have some skill. Can you hire me? And he would start working there. He would work there, you know, during the day and at night. He'd go and do Bible studies on, on the Sabbath. He'd go into the synagogues. He would just go minister to people. But he was bivocational. When we first started Denver Calvary, I was just vocational. I just had a regular job in the world. I worked for Apple. I was a computer guy. And, and that's what I did for a number of years until the church grew. And that's what Paul did. Lastly, he says in verse 9, he says, not because we don't have authority, but we want to make ourselves an example how you should follow. Now, when Paul says he has authority, Paul had authority. What's that mean? He started this church. He was the pastor of this church. He was an apostle of Christ. He was an evangelist by the call of Jesus Christ himself. In other words, He can come in and just say, hey, you need to listen to me because I'm an apostle. We could use the authority. I can come and say, hey, you need to support me because I'm an apostle. And Paul was supported in other times. But in this case, in Thessalonica, he's like, I'm not trying to take advantage of you. I have authority to to receive from the church, but I'm not. And in that, you need to follow my example. Again, Paul drops an important principle about this aspect of working. Well, this is important for us to hear. And what's the principle that Paul gives? Look at verse 10. He says, for, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this, if anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in a disorderly manner, not working at all, but are busybodies. Here's the command that Paul gives. If you are a Christian, a Christian must do everything in their power to earn a living. We are to work for our food. Do you know that's a command of God? That you have to work for a living? You have to work to eat? The idea of the church caring for all your needs is not a biblical reality. But some people think that. We get calls every single day at our church for people wanting money. And there's a variety of reasons why they're in that situation. And nine out of 10 times, the answer is no, because they're not living responsibly with what they've been entrusted. And so there's this idea that the church has money and the church will meet all my needs. That's not a biblical concept. Well, how do we know that? Paul makes it clear. If anyone will not work, neither will he eat. That goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It's very important we do our best to work, that we do our best to to earn a living. And why? Why should we do that? Well, there's two things that that allows. One, it allows our lives to be sustained. We earn a living, shelter, and food. It allows us to to, uh, save money, to, to, to do the things that we need and the things that we want. But secondly, when we earn a living, it allows us to serve others. It allows us to bless others. It allows us to help those that are in need. That is always the principle in scripture, right? We want to have right relationship with God. We want to have right relationship with man. We love God. We love people. We serve God. We serve people. That is always the principle we find. And our finances allow us to do that. Paul, when he writes to Titus, Titus 3.14, he says, and let our people learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. You know, one of the ways that urgent needs are often met are through finances. And though the idea of the church itself to meet that, the reality is we meet each other's needs in our lives. And it's such a blessing when we see that happen. You know, I've seen a number of situations where people were in a, in a medical situation and they didn't have funds that they needed to start procedures and people in the church just rallied around them and says, hey, let's pitch in and we're gonna help. I remember that happened to my wife and I. You know, we never made much money doing ministry. And a season in which we didn't have any money 
and our cars needed, our, one of our cars needed tires really, really bad, and they were like balding, and you could see the wire, whatever the case might be, and people heard about that, and like a couple weeks later, we got this envelope with like 600 bucks to buy tires for our car. We never once asked for that. We never once said, oh, do you have any spare change? It wasn't like that at all, and we, I remember I, I just started crying. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, like who did this? And no one would say. And no, we, don't, we, can't get, we can't receive this. And they're like, it's too late. You touched it, right? I don't know if that's the rule. Like, you touch it, it's like, you have to take it. And there was such huge, I was humbled by that. I was humbled that I received that. I was not, not ashamed, but there was humility to receive that and, and had to say, thank you for helping meet my need. It comes very naturally. Again, Paul is speaking to these Christians in Thessalonica, and he tells them, guys, You can't be taking advantage of the other believers. You can't be doing that. You need to go work. You need to work because you need to occupy till Jesus comes. You need to work so you can sustain yourselves. But you need to work so you're not taking advantage of the other believers. And so again, we see that they were not following Paul's instructions. They were taking money and food from the others. They were not doing their part in their church community. And you know what happens when, when people do that in the church, what happens in the church when people are taking advantage of is that they get hurt. They get offended. They, they don't want to come to church anymore. They, they might even leave the church because of an offense of a, of a believer taking advantage of them. And it's a sad thing when that happens. It's not meant to be in the church. And many times when someone leaves, they'll take other people with them. And it's so hurtful. Again, when believers act selfishly in the church, it hurts its other members. It causes division. It gives room for the enemy to bring discouragement what the church should be. Bottom line, it undermines the work of the church, the unity of the church, the spirit of God working in that church. And one of the other things that Paul addresses is that they were becoming busybodies. I don't know, when was the last time you ever heard that? don't be a busybody, right? I, mean, I think I remember that more when I was younger as a kid than as an adult. A busybody are those that are always meddling in other people's affairs. They busy themselves by knowing the gossip, what's happening in other people's lives, their sin, their struggles, what they're doing. Did you hear about Pastor Louie? Oh, uh, you know, something's going on with his tires for cars or his car. And maybe he's not responsible. Is he, does he even tithe? Whatever the case might be. And they're going around and they're being busy bodies. And it's because they weren't being busy themselves. And that's one of the things that happens when we're not being obedient to God's word. It opens doors for other areas of sin or disobedience to creep in to our own lives. And so Paul says, you need to work. Look what he says in verse 12 down to verse 13. He says, now those who are such, we command you and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they work in quietness and eat their own bread. But as for you, brethren, don't grow weary in doing good. Once again, Paul uses this strong exhortation. He says, guys, this is not a suggestion or a good idea. This is a command of God. You need to go get a job. You need to go and work. You need to care for yourselves. You got to stop meddling in other people's uh, uh, lives. Again, Paul planted this church. He was their pastor, pastor. He was an apostle. And here he is demanding them to do what God's word says. You know, our little church has been around almost 12 years. And we planted Denver Calvary, my wife and I, and our kids. They were just little at the time. And planning a church always comes at a great price and a great commitment. More than you probably will ever imagine or know. My wife and I, we've had the privilege of serving the Lord for some 28, not 29, 30 years together as teenagers, growing in ministry together, serving in multiple large churches. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to see a church grow, to see people built up in faith, to see people saved, walk in obedience and baptism. But it's also a very challenging thing as a pastor. It gets difficult when people disobey God's word, when people gossip and harm other people in the church. 
It's hurtful when people think they can just leave a church at any whim because they have an issue with someone else and they don't ask for counsel or direction or clarity or pray and seek the Lord. It's difficult when they're not obeying God's word. And like the Apostle Paul, I command you today to obey God's word, to love God's word, to embrace God's word. Don't take my word for it. Read it for yourselves. See what God says, and then go and do it. But when God's word is not followed, it's discouraging. When there's a lack of willingness for a church to follow God's word, to follow their leaders, their pastors, it's discouraging. And Paul mentions this in verse 13. Look what he says. But as for you, brethren, don't grow weary in doing good. Why does Paul have to encourage them in this? Because they were growing discouraged with those other members in the church not obeying the Bible, not obeying God's word, not doing what they should be doing. And they themselves were getting discouraged. This can happen. We can get discouraged. Again, he's addressing the good Christians. The Christians, I wouldn't say good Christians, but I would say obedient Christians. He's saying, guys, continue doing what, what God's asked you to do. Don't allow their actions to stop you from your obedience in the Lord. Seek him. Don't grow weary. It's interesting, again, Paul uses the same language for another church, a, the church in Galatia, the church of Galatia, a number of churches in that area. But Galatians 6, 9, almost identical, Paul says, let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. You know, sometimes as a believer, sometimes as a member of a church, sometimes as a pastor, leader, or servant in a church, we can feel as if our efforts are meaningless. You can feel that they're fruitless, they're pointless. We get frustrated. Maybe things are changing for the worst and not the better. That there are setbacks in the ministry. There's setbacks in the volunteers. There's setbacks in people's commitment. There's setbacks maybe in our marriages, in life, ministry, our children, our jobs. And this is really important, especially for those that serve here at Denver Calvary. If you serve as a leader or as an elder, as an overseer of ministry, it's for you not to grow weary in doing good. Maybe we're not getting the volunteers we need in a particular ministry. Maybe we see people having to step aside or step down or flake out altogether. Don't grow weary in doing good because the scripture says we shall reap if we don't lose heart. I can, sh I can share with you an area that we've been praying over and it's been challenging. You know, our Wednesday nights, our goal on Wednesday nights is to duplicate Sunday on Wednesday nights. And it's been a huge blessing. Our, our potluck fellowship is well attended. People come and they love that. They share meals with each other. Our church service is a blessing. People come, the word of God is taught, worship is given, communion is distributed and received. It's a blessing. But the one thing that's been a challenge on Wednesday nights is to get enough volunteers to love and serve our children. It's just a challenging season to get that. And again, we're not trying to manufacture it in the flesh. We want it to be a work of the Spirit, but nonetheless, it can be discouraging. I know my wife has spent um, many, many Wednesdays serving there. Our leaders um, who do many other aspects of ministry are committed there when they want to be in service, but can't. It's an area of struggle, but you can also pray over that with us. So all in all, Paul's conclusion with Paul's thoughts is, is for every believer to realize that there is accountability and responsibility in the church. He tells them in verse 14 and 15, as we kind of wrap up this morning, he says, if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet, do not count him as an enemy but admonish him as a brother. Again, Paul makes it clear. Note those that aren't obedient to God's word. This is a strong exhortation. Might even be a little scary. But he, if he says, if you see them not doing that, mark them, note them. Say, hey, you're not doing what God's asked you to do. And then he says to distance yourself from them. There's space that needs to be given that we need to remove close 
intimate fellowship with them. That's those that aren't obeying God's word. Those that, that we should not be keeping company with. Mark them, note them. Again, how is this lived out in the church? It means this. We need to give room for the Holy Spirit to bring about conviction and change in their life. If they won't hear God's word, they won't hear the leadership, they won't hear you as a believer, we need to separate ourselves from them to give room for the Holy Spirit to work in them and bring about them the change that only God can do. And here's the thing that we might get wrong. And I've seen this get wrong. In verse 15, Paul closes this section with another admonishment. He says, don't count them as an enemy. Now, this is important because sometimes we look at those that might be in sin or struggling in disobedience in these areas of compromise or lack of submission, and we feel like there's betrayal to us or to God. And a lot of times we want to treat them like an enemy. But Paul's saying, don't do that. They're not an enemy of God. They're not an enemy of yours. They're just struggling with obedience. Maybe they're not even struggling. Maybe they're just flat out disobedient. Don't treat them as an enemy, but he says how to treat them. Admonish them as a brother. A brother, a member of your family. A brother that that needs encouragement, exhortation, rebuke. We go to them in humility, love, and grace and says, man, hey, have you you had a change of heart on these things? Because, man, you need to get back on track. They're not an enemy of God. Don't treat them like that. Here's what it requires. Please listen to me on this. This is 30 years of ministry I'm going to give to you in one sentence. It requires thick skin while maintaining a soft heart. That's what we need in the church. So often we're thin skin with a hard heart. We get easily offended by other people's weaknesses and sins, and we get offended by that. And then we get angry towards them and resistant, and we're mean and and just unloving and uncaring. That's the wrong way to deal with it. Again, 30 years of ministry that Pastor Chuck has taught us, Pastor Jeff has taught me, Pastor Ed has taught me, is in the ministry we need thick skin, but a soft heart. Thick skin to handle the discouragements of ministry and life and other believers in the church, but maintaining the heart of Jesus, love and compassion and grace. This is a hard principle to gain and to practice. How do we do it? We look to Jesus. You know, there's no one in the world, there's no one in ministry who's ever had the perfect disposition like Jesus. You look at Jesus, how he dealt with the lawyers the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, how he addressed people that were wealthy and rich, but also how he dealt with the poor, the sick, his disciples, how he dealt with people who flat out rejected him to his face. He did it with grace and love. Yeah, there were at times he made a whip. Oh man, boy, would I love to see that. He made a whip. He whipped people, guys. He knocked over tables as they were abusing the temple of God, abusing the people of God in their sincerity of worship. There were times that he looked at the Pharisees and called them names, vipers, you snakes, you filthy rats. (laughs) And there were other times in which the religious leaders would come to him in humility and he received them. He received the sick and, and the broken, the hurting. Those that were there to take advantage of Jesus, he still received and loved. They were there just for a free meal. We look at the example of Jesus as we learn to deal with one another in life. Again, this little church of ours, Denver Calvary, we have to be ready to do life together as a church. And it gets messy really fast. We bring our baggage. You bring your baggage in this church. I bring my baggage in this church. And as we do that, we do life together. It only can be done with love and grace and patience Again, thick skin and a soft heart. All of this goes back to Paul's theme and the message of our, the title of our message today. It's accountability and responsibility. I'm responsible to God's word. You are responsible to God's word. I am accountable to God's word and you are accountable to God's word. You are responsible in your church and you are accountable in your church. Do you today want to be part of an exciting, loving, and healthy church. It requires every one of us to do our part to fulfill our role, to be obedient to the Lord, to confess our sin, to repent, to seek after him, 
to do what is right, godly, and honorable to the Lord. Lastly, Paul closes verse 16 through 18. Read it with me. It says, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. Let the Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with my own hand. This is a sign in every epistle. So I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Paul closes his epistle and he reminds them, hey guys, this is not a false letter. This is actually one by me. Again, part of the issue that was creeping into the church in Thessalonica is some false letters were coming claiming to be apostles and they were teaching them some wrong things. So Paul says, hey, this letter is by my hand. I'm signing this bad boy. This is from me to you, from God to you. Receive it and may God's grace cover you. We must walk in grace. Everything about the church, every believer in the church is saved by faith through grace, through grace, through his loving grace. Not because you're good, but because God was loving and gracious first. It comes with peace. He says, again, may the Lord give you peace. We can't have peace until we're right with the Lord. He gives us supernatural peace. So may the Lord instruct us today to hear these things, to receive them, and lastly, to go and do them. Amen.